My name is Paula Moraga, and I'm an assistant professor of statistics at the Gin Abdullah University of Science and Technology, known as CAUS, in Saudi Arabia, where I'm also the principal investigator of the GeoHealth Research Group. My research focuses on the development of statistical methods and computational tools for geospatial data analysis and health surveillance. For example, I've developed methods to understand the spatial and spatiotemporal patterns of diseases such as malaria in Africa, leptospirosis in Brazil, and cancer in Australia. I've also developed a number of R packages for Bayesian disease mapping, detection of clusters, and risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease. And I'm the author of the book, The Spatial Health Data Modeling and Visualization with R, Ila, and Shiny. This book is published by CRC, and it's also freely available online. And it covers ho how to manipulate and transform spatial data and how to create maps using R. It covers how to fit spatial and spatial temporal models using ILA and SPDE and how to create interactive visualizations, reproducible reports, dashboards, and shiny web applications that facilitate the communication with collaborators and policymakers. In addition, the, the book focuses on health, but the methods explained are useful to analyze spatial data in many other disciplines. Today, I'm going to talk about geospatial models for tropical disease mapping. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about modeling of lymphatic filariasis in sub-Saharan Africa and modeling of leptospirosis in Brazil. Lymphatic filariasis is a disease caused by microscopic worms and transmitted by mosquitoes. So when the mosquito bites the person, the worms go to the lymphatic system and there, they cause blockages that cause swelling of the arms, the legs, and also thick and hard skin. And this is a disease that is also called elephantiasis. This is a very painful disease. Uh, people with the disease are rejected by those in their communities, and this leads to a lot of suffering and to poverty. Lymphatic filariosis affects tropical and subtropical regions in the world, such as Asia and the Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also parts in the Caribbean and South America. The main strategy against lymphatic filariosis is mass drug administration, which is recommended to populations in regions where prevalence exceeds 1% annually for at least five years. Ideally, we would give the medications to, to everyone that needs them, but in reality, resources are limited and we need to decide which are the areas most in need. So in this study, we wanted to predict lymphatic filariasis in Sub-Saharan Africa. We had 3,197 surveys uh, collected between 1990 and 2014. And uh, like here we see that um, we have areas with low prevalence and other areas with higher prevalence, but we don't know anything about areas where we don't have uh, samples or, or surveys. So what we want to do is to go from this map in the left to this map that shows a spatially continuous surface of lymphatic filariosis that can be useful for decision making. In order to do that, we are going to use information uh, on factors known to affect lymphatic filariosis transmission. Uh, and we are going to use um, a model-based approach. Here, at each of the locations XI, we have a survey where we uh, tested NI people uh, for uh, lymphatic filariasis. So we saw that uh, out of NI people, YI are positive for the disease. 
So we can say that conditional on the true prevalence of the disease, the number of people that tested positive is binomial distributed with parameters ni, that is the number of people in the survey, and p, because that is the, the, the prevalence of the disease. And then we say that the logit of the prevalence is equal to some covariates plus random effects. In the covariates, we're going to include factors that we know that affect uh, transmission, such as precipitation, vegetation, elevation, and so on. And we also are going to put random effects to model variability that cannot be explained by the covariates. So there will be other factors that we cannot measure or we don't know how to measure, but affect the disease. And this information will, will be modeled with the random effect. And here we're going to put a spatial random effect to recognize that the locations that are close to each other may have similar risk. And also an independent random effect to recognize that although two locations may be uh, close to each other, they may have different risks. So applying this model, uh, we get the results, so we, we get a map with the predictions, and here we can see that the risk is higher in the east coast of Africa, east coast of Madagascar, and also in pockets in the west. And uh, we have lower prevalence in Ethiopia and in the center. In addition, we can calculate lower and upper limits of 95% credible intervals that allow us to, to understand what is the uncertainty in these predictions. So these maps are very useful for decision making. They can help surveillance activities by identifying areas that require enhanced interventions. And also they are, setting, uh, they are useful for setting a benchmark for evaluating the impact of interventions. The second study is um, about modeling of leptospirosis in Brazil. Um, leptospirosis is a disease transmitted by the urine of the rats or an environment contaminated with the urine of the rats. People with leptospirosis may have fever, headaches, and more severe symptoms such as pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome. Leptospirosis is a urban health problem due to the rapid and disorganized expansion of urban centers that creates ecological conditions for rat ball transmission. And it affects vulnerable populations such as farmers and residents of urban slums in the tropics. In this study, we assess leptospirosis in Pauda Lima. Pauda Lima is a urban slum community in Salvador de Bahia in Brazil with a high annual incidence of leptospirosis. So here we have an aerial photograph and we can see that um, the, the Pau de Lima has four valleys. In the bottom part of the valley, there is more vegetation and the sanitation conditions are worse. And the upper part of the valley uh, is close to a main road and the infrastructure is much better. Here we have some photographs. We can see that households are at different elevations. We have open sewers, a lot of vegetation, accumulated trash, and people carry out activities that are risk activities, such as being in contact with mud and water that can be contaminated. So in this study, we wanted to understand the spatiotemporal patterns of leptospirosis and identified targets for intervention in Pau de Lima. We recruited 2003 subjects and followed them for a four year period. And each year, we administer questionnaires and GIS mapping to determine socio behavioral and environmental risk factors. Um, we uh, did uh, that by uh, fitting this model, a spatial temporal mix model here, yij is equal to one if person i at time j has the disease and zero otherwise. So we can say that conditional on the prevalence, yij 
follows a Bernoulli distribution with parameters the prevalence. And then we can say that the logit of the prevalence is equal to some covariates plus random effect. In the covariates, we are going to put different information that we collected. I will talk about that later. And in the random effects, uh, we are going to model variability that cannot be explained by the covariate. This is a spatial temporal random effect that has an autoregressive component. So the effect at time j is dependent on the previous time. And also we have here a component that is independent in time, but especially dependent at its time. This is the information we collected. We have demographic and social status factors such as gender, age, be literate, health factors such as diagnosed with dengue since last visit, occupational exposure such as working in Pau de Lima, household environment such as elevation of the household or distance to wet sewer or trash, household and work behavior such as contact with flood water or mud or tar or, or trash near house or near job, and household and work reservoirs such as observing rats near house or near job. So we have all of these variables and now we're going to select some of them to include them in the fixed part of the model. And we're going to follow this approach. We're going to, we have variables in eight groups and with, within each group, we are going to fit a generalized additive model using all the categorical variables, nonlinear effects of the continuous variables and interactions between them. And then we're going to remove covariates one by one until obtaining a model with minimum AC. By doing this, we will obtain variables in each of the groups. And then we put all the variables together and do, and do the same. We fit a, a generalized additive model with all the variables and then remove covariates one by one until obtaining a, a model with minimum AC. So finally, uh, this is the model that uh, we, we, these are the variables that, that we obtain. We have that uh, the model includes year of follow up, gender, being literate, house elevation, observing rats near house, contact with mud near house, and a non-linear effect of age. And we're going to, to model this effect with, with a piecewise linear function with break at 20. So we observed that uh, the risk of leptospirosis is greater in year four compared to year one and lower in year three compared to year one. And we have that risk factors are male being illiterate, observing rats near home, contact with mud near home. And we also see that the risk of leptospirosis increases with age until age 20, and then it's more or less constant. And this, is, this makes sense because young people have more risk activities, such as being outside with contact with mud or water, or water that can be contaminated. We also plotted the areas with the highest in red and lowest in blue odds of infection. We see that the pattern is consi consistent over time high risk areas are in the lower part of the valleys and uh, low risk areas are in the in the in the upper part where uh, where we have better infrastructures in addition we also examined the residuals because we wanted to identify areas where the risk was higher or lower than predicted by the risk factor and predicted by the factors that we put in the fixed part of the model. So this is a high risk region in which uh, the measured risk is consistent with prediction. And we have a lot of vegetation, accumulated trash, open sewers, and rats can be seen very easily. This is a, a region, a location with high positive residual. So the risk is higher than is predicted by the risk factors. 
And this is because there is poor household construction and there is flood risk due up to poor infrastructure. And these are locations with high negative residual. So these are locations where the risk is lower than predicted by the risk factors. And this is because there, these are open sewers, uh, but these open sewers have a structural barriers to stop overflow. So the risk is, uh, is lower. So to conclude, uh, we have seen that young adults, males, and individuals with low social status have higher risk of leptospirosis. Interventions such as providing adequate sanitation systems may reduce the burden of leptospirosis. And we have also looked at the residuals. And we have seen that in areas in which transmission risk cannot be adequately explained using known risk factors, enable the identif identification of new hypotheses about transmission. Um, finally, before finishing, I wanted to, to tell you that I recently joined CAUST and I'm looking for outstanding PhD students and postdocs to join my group. So if you are interested in your spatial data analysis, the development of R packages and applications in health and the environment, and would like to join the group, please uh, get in touch. CAUST offers an excellent research environment, free tuition, monthly living allowance, free housing, and it's an excellent university to study and research. These are some references, the Asian Health Data Book, and also some papers about uh, my research in statistics and public health surveillance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Great to hear in, in so much detail about your research. Uh, we have a few questions on the chat. So I wanted to start with a question from Sajni Malde, who has asked, um, thanks, Paula. I am looking at modeling dengue outbreaks in a geospatial model. I have found that the random effects part account for the majority of the drivers of the model. The other variables influence the prediction very minimally. Is this your experience also? Well, I, I have not worked with dengue, but um but I would say that uh, we need to find coverage that, that explain the risk. Maybe you can be, maybe you can try, for example, uh, variables such as rainfall uh, or other variables have a lag effect. Maybe if 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 you want to put rainfall as a as a driver of the of the dengue risk, maybe you can try a rainfall that occurred a few days ago, and maybe this this can help. Okay, that's a great piece of advice. Um, and then Stepan Lavrinenko has asked, Paula, can you describe your choice of this modeling technique? Uh, would you have an article published on this study? I think you already have an article, but maybe you can share links. Yes, yeah, so uh, what, what I did was to use, um, well, the articles are here. We have uh, the, the paper about leptospirosis is, is this published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. And the paper about lymphatic filariasis is published in Parasites and Vectors. And what I had was, was geostatistical data. So we, I, I had point data of the disease measured at a specific locations. And what I did was to, to use a model-based geostatistics techniques to predict uh, the risk in, in a continuous surface. Okay. Um, Stuart Norris also has asked a question here. He first of all says, excellent talk. Uh, why did you use backwards step selection and AIC rather than forwards and backwards step and look at AIC and BIC? Yes, yeah, so uh, when I did this, like we follow this approach and this is one approach, but there are many other approaches that we can use. So. What we wanted to know, we wanted to do is um, to pick several variables uh, because we wanted to interpret uh, the effect of each of the variables in the risk. So we wanted a simple model that we could interpret. But for example, if your objective is prediction, like I want to predict very accurately, I don't, I don't mind about interpretation. 
You can follow other approaches. For example, you can use uh, machine learning methods uh, or ensemble methods that uh, uses all of these covariates or the most important of these covariates and, 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 and give you a, a very good prediction. And then once you have the prediction, you, you can put it in the model together with the random effect. This is the, the approach we thought that could be, uh, could be uh, good for our needs. Uh, we, we put all the covariates and then we remove covariates one by one. You can, it, it's also possible to do it, uh, like you say, uh, like a start building the model from a, a few variables and, and build a bigger model. So this is just uh, one of the options. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then one final question we have here from Sandra Bempa. Uh, she asks, I'm curious, well, thank you for this amazing presentation. I am just curious, have there been any interventions designed or implemented out of this research? How have residents benefited from this? Yeah, so I know that uh, for the leptospirosis um, project, they have uh, used our findings uh, to 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 go to the to the to the to the favela to the to the to the location and, and they have explained uh, to the um, uh, people living there uh, specifically uh, what are the risk factors what are uh, a model found and they have improved all of these areas that are model identified uh, as high risk areas. Fantastic. Great to hear it's having such an impact. Um, brilliant. Well, Paula, thank you so much for joining us. Um, your presentation will be available on YouTube, and I'm sure that if you want to have a conversation with Paula, she'll answer any of your questions on the Slack channel or on the chat here in Hopin. So, Paula, great to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and congratulations for this great conference. Thank you.